Hey, well, good morning, Christ Church. Doesn't it feel good to be in the presence of Jesus today? Sterlington and Rustin, we're so glad to be worshiping with you. Come on, I know we've already given Jesus a round of applause, but can we just give you one more round of applause this morning? Well, y'all look good. Um, Maybe that hour of sleep didn't hurt you too bad. I woke up this morning and I thought, man, the older I get, the more that one little hour affects me so much. But uh, you look good. You look good today. Um, Hey, turn your Bibles to Judges chapter six. That's where we're gonna be hanging out as you're doing that. I wanna just highlight a couple of things. Like you just heard, Easter is just right around the corner. Our team has some handout cards they wanna give you um, because we know there's somebody in your world that needs an invitation to be at church on Easter weekend. They're just one Im- invitation away for them, li- for them, li- for their lives to be radically changed by the gospel. And so we want to give that, uh, give you an opportunity. Maybe this is something that you put into someone's hand. Or maybe this is for you and you put it on your dash of your car so that every time that you get in the vehicle that you are reminded, man, who am I bringing with me on Easter weekend? And so it's gonna be a powerful time. If you'll get them here, I promise you they will have an encounter with Jesus and we as a family, as a team, we're gonna love on them and make them feel at home and make them feel a part of this community here. And we just believe that God's gonna do some amazing, amazing things over the course of that weekend. But before we get to Easter, I want to bring up again, I want to bring up a night of hope and healing is this Wednesday night at 630. All of our churches are coming together on this location. Somebody say this Wednesday, Wednesday. 630. We want you to be here. You might say, well, I don't really go to Wednesday night church. Well, we're asking you. Our pastors are asking you. Maybe you have your workout time is at 6.30 on Wednesday nights. I'm asking you to postpone or don't go. Here's your one uh, excuse that you don't have to go to workout. But be here Wednesday night, 6.30. It's gonna be a powerful time in the presence of the Lord. And I know that whatever you bring in, God's going to meet you with. God's gonna meet you right there. If there's friends in your life that need, if there's some friends in your life that need a healing, bring them with you. It's gonna be an amazing, amazing time. Amen? Amen. I think I got through all that. So let's jump into the word today. Uh, we got any sports fans here? Anybody like sports? I love sports. Uh, how many of you guys played sports when you were younger? I played sports when I was younger and uh, just yesterday, we were watching LSU baseball, and it's, uh, I mean, I just, I just love sports, and, but you know that if you like sports, if you played sports, any time that you're about to go into a game, you always have a game plan for your opponent. Take football, for example, not soccer, real football. Um, sorry for all my soccer fans, but before every game, everybody on the team, they know the game plan. So, for example, the game plan may be we're going to run the ball, we're going to run the ball, we're going to run the ball until we wear them down, and then in the fourth quarter, we're going to start passing the ball. And it's the game plan. Everybody, everybody knows the game plan on the team. Well, you know what normally happens. You get in the game, and some things change, and you're behind. So what do you do? You have to change the game plan. Where it was, I was going to run the ball, run the ball. Now, maybe it's in the second quarter, and you're having to pass the ball so that you can so you can win the game. Because everybody there, we know this, you're not there just to play, you're there to win the game. And so what do you have to do? You have to make some game time adjustments because you want to come out victorious at the end of the game. Sometimes when I watch LSU Tigers football, I get so frustrated with it. Um, it's like they come and they have a game plan and they start using the game plan and the game plan no longer works, but what do they do? Do they change the game plan? No, they just keep running the same old game plan. I'm like, come on. I'm like the, you know, Monday morning coach. It's like, man, what are they doing? I get so frustrated because I know, like, if you're on the team, you're not just there to dress out and show up. You're there to win the game. You know, for us in life, I don't think any of us just want to live. I think... We want to win in life. We want to cross the goal line in life. There's some things that we want to make happen in our life. There's some things that we, we want to make sure are in place. We want to make sure we want to be successful. We want to be successful in our careers. We want our families to be successful. And you go to life with all these 
looking forward to where you want to be and you have a game plan to get you to where you hope to be one day. But how many know that sometimes, even in life, that the game plan needs to be changed just a little bit? You need to shift the game plan. And today, that's what I want to talk to us about. I want to talk about for us that walked into the room today. And there needs to be a, maybe it's a slight shift in your game plan. Or maybe you came in here today and after today's message, you know that there needs to be a complete switch completely in your game plan so that we can be locked and loaded, so that we can be ready, so that when we step out of this room, that we're able to step into exactly what God wants us to do and what he wants to do in our lives. Amen? Amen. Judges chapter six. Here we are. It says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak and Ophrah that belongs to Joash, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. If you don't know this story, maybe if you grew up in church, you know this story, but if you don't, the Israelites, they are now back being just their lands, their homes, all being just ransacked by the Midians. And they would basically come in and just tear everything up and take everything and would leave all the Israelites starving, looking for food. And so here Gideon is, verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, this is the, uh, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all of his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replies, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you And you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. This is a very powerful interaction. Midian's story is powerful and it brings so much insight and and it has so much power that I know it's radically changed my life. But this conversation, it is powerful because I believe that in our day and age that we're living in right now, we identify with this moment in Gideon's life very well in the insecurity that we we identify in the I don't have what it takes kind of mentality. God's asking us to do something and what do we say? I feel less than. I don't know if I can do that. I, I don't think I have the ability to do that or man, God, you should probably pick someone else. I don't even think I would pick me and all this language I think it really strikes a chord in this day and age and how we live our lives in the 21st century. I mean, we love this idea that life's been so hard. You know, it's tough. You sad? Oh yeah, it's okay to be sad. You've been through so much. And let me just be upfront. There's nothing wrong with this. It's in the Bible. What we feel is real. I felt like this. My concern is when you become content in this mindset. My concern is when we elevate this type of mindset in the, in the name of keeping it real and it becomes our way of life. It becomes the standard for our life. And so now the standard is fear. The standard is brokenness. The standard is insecurity When you're really an authentic Christian is when you're scared. It's become the standard. I would say it's okay to be scared. Moses was scared. Gideon, in this moment, he was scared. I could go down the list. As a matter of fact, I don't know anyone that that God has used that wasn't terrified over what God was asking them to do. It's okay for us to have those feelings, but for us as Christians, not just while we're at church, but in business, in our families, 
in our, in our communities, in our politics, in our education, in order for us to be everything that God wants us to be. We can't allow this to be the standard. This way of thinking for us to talk back to God over and over and over again and stay in the wine press threshing wheat and say, God, you know my heart though. You know my heart. So I wanna make sure that we're not stuck running the wrong play, stuck in a game plan that doesn't work, stuck in reminding ourselves that I'm not enough, stuck in this mentality, I I, I just can't do it. God should pick someone else. And for the record, we all know this, but we're nothing without Jesus. Our lives are nothing but a pile of rubble without Jesus. We know that it's the grace of God that saved our lives. We know we can't do it in our own strength. We know that we, we are in and of ourselves, we're, we're nothing. All of that's true. But do you know what else is true? Is that God has picked you. He's picked you. And since God has picked you, at some point, there has to be a switch. There has to be a switch in your mind and in your life. I'm just telling you where I'm at. Like Gideon, I have wrestled over and over and over for far too long. I found myself living in these verses in chapter six where God is like, you can. And I'm like, I can, but, I can, but, pardon me, my Lord, living there over and over and over again. It may not look like this to everyone else. It may have not looked like this to everyone else, but I know what was going on on the inside of me. I knew the conversations that I I was having with myself and the conversations I was having with God. To everyone else, it it may have looked like I was walking in victory, but I know that I just kept trying to talk God out of what he said. Pardon me, my Lord. Pardon me, use them, use that family, use their voice, use their strengths and and their weaknesses. And it just came to a point, it's like, I don't want to live in chapter six anymore. I want to live in chapter eight and I want you to live in chapter eight. Because if you look over in chapter eight, let me just tell you, Gideon, after he wins the the battle, this brother switches and everything changes. The way he carries himself changes. The way he begins to talk to people radically changes. He would come and find people and say, hey, feed my my men some some bread. They're like, what do you mean? We're not feeding them any bread. You haven't won the battle. And he's like, well, when I go take care of them, then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna take care of you too. I mean, this brother changed. It was like it's a different person. Once he was saying, I was afraid. Once he was saying, I was afraid to pursue, I was afraid to attack, or I did it, but I did it reluctantly. I'll do it, but I'll do it with hesitation. How many, I mean, I mean, if this is not our life story, I'll do it only when I have to. I'll do it, but I'm really, really, really scared. And it's fine to do things scared. But at some point, you have to switch from doing everything in fear and begin to step into who God wants you to be so you don't waste your time, so you don't waste the time of the people around you, that you don't waste God's time. As a matter of fact, I'm not so sure if this way of thinking and communicating to God like this is not insulting God, you can choose me, but I'm gonna argue with the the creator of the universe and say, ah, you got it wrong on this one. I hope that you're getting this this morning and and I'm articulating it in a way that you understand what I'm saying because I need you to understand this. The body of Christ needs you. Our community, North Louisiana, needs you. Put your hand on your chest and says, my community needs me. 
the lost and dying world, they need you. We are the army of Christ. And we're here and we've come to march into the enemy's camp and to take back every soul, to take back every person that the enemy has bound up. We're saying, here we are, Jesus, use us. Use us for your glory to empty out hell and the gates of hell should not, should not prevail against us. It's a switch. It's a switch that happens. I'm just telling you for me, on the outside, it may look the same, but on the inside, I've made up my mind. I am not expending any more energy on second guessing what God has said. Amen. I'm not second guessing it. And I want you to move over into chapter eight too. Maybe you're here and you're, and you're second guessing and you're spending time and energy on saying, God, is it really me? I don't think I can. I want you to make the switch. When we walk out of this room, we walk out of here knowing with our shoulders back, knowing that we, we've got the God of the universe on our side. So let me just help you make this switch this morning. A couple of things, if you're taking notes. First thing is this. The first thing you gotta do is, is be aware. It's all about awareness. Begin to recognize when you fall into this woe is me type of mindset. Awareness is the first step in making change. Awareness is the first thing in making this switch in your life. The Bible over and over again emphasizes the importance of self-awareness, self-examination. Psalms 139, we know what it says. Search me, God. Search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. If you see there is any offensive way in me, see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The word teaches us that we need to be aware of our, of our thoughts. We need to be aware of our, of our feelings. We need to be aware of our actions. You, you're aware of what they are and then seeking God's guidance. Now I'll just add this, not social media's guidance, not your favorite author's guidance, not your new favorite podcast guidance. Seeking God's guidance for correction and repentance in your life. It's awareness. You gotta be able to be aware. Like, I'm not gonna do that. The second thing is to challenge the negative thoughts. Challenge them. When you catch yourself thinking or even saying out loud, pardon me, my Lord. Pardon me. Playing the victim. Challenge those thoughts. Filter them through the word of God. We know what 2 Corinthians says. Take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. You gotta, you, you, it comes in, it's like, oh, that doesn't line up with what, the word of God. That, that's not gonna be something that I'm gonna meditate on. It's not gonna be something that I linger on because I know what God's word says. His word says that, that, that greater is he that is within me than he that's in the world. And there's no weapon that can be formed that will prosper in my life. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So I'm not the weakest. I'm not gonna live in this thought. The last thing is this, is avoid comparing yourself. This is a huge one. The Bible says that it's unwise to comp compare yourselves among yourselves. One pastor says, as Christians, many times we find ourselves living in the land of Ur. What's the land of Ur? Well, it's when we look around and we think they are smarter. They're smarter. They're prettier. Just comparing ourselves. They're richer. For me, it'd be they're taller. <laughs> well, they're nicer. Just comparing. Oh, look at, look at their family. They're happier. Look what they're doing. Look how God is using them. You know what? They're braver. The land of earth. So what happens is we begin to journey through life. And everywhere we look and everywhere we turn, what do we feel? We just feel less than. Because we're comparing. Someone, someone says, you know how to kill a great thing? 
is just to compare it to something else. Just to be completely transparent, my number two strength is competition. And if you're very competitive, then you know that you constantly are comparing things. You know, many times we'll try to, you know, put it under the heading of we just want to get better. But man, a lot of times we just compare. I compare what you have on to what I have on to your house, to my house. Because you're so competitive that you, you just always want to be a step ahead. You always want to be better. And the healthy version of that is it's always, hey, I want, to be, I want to be healthier than I was tomorrow than I am today. Not comparing what I have versus what you have. It's all about let me grow. Let me, let me judge today on how much I love someone versus tomorrow. I want to be a little bit better. I want to love a little bit harder. I want to extend a little bit more grace. But if my guess is true for most of us, whether we're driving down the road or whether we're on campus, whether we're on our own street, we're constantly comparing. And what happens is, it's like, pardon me, my Lord. And we just become envious of everybody around us. I love what Proverbs says about this. It says, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. It rots the bones. It's a switch. It's a switch. And again, I I hope you're getting this. I hope you're understanding what I'm trying to communicate today because he's called all of us, not just one person. He's called us all as a church family, as a body, as business leaders, as family leaders, as husbands, as wives, as as students, as married folks, as single folks. He brought us all together and God is doing something here. He's pouring his spirit out. We're not the only place. It's, it's happening all over the world, South America, Africa, Asia. We aren't the only ones, but we're not left out. We're right in it. With the outpouring of his spirit, we are right in the middle of it. I'm just saying, how long are we gonna live in this back and forth, back and forth, with our, pardon me, my Lord. I'm the weakest. It's a switch. Look, we know that it's the cross that radically changed our lives. And it's Jesus that's bringing us into new life. So I want us as a body, as individuals. I will say, I believe that God sent me here today to tell you this. That for us, I want us to step in. I want us to step forward into everything that God has for us as a body. But I want you as a husband or as a father or as a business leader, I want you to step into everything that God has for you. But it's a switch. It's a switch to say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not gonna live like that. I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna think like that anymore. I'm gonna know that the creator of the universe, the all-powerful God, has chosen me, and he's chosen you. You received that word today? Come on, put your hands together, and let's just celebrate. <laughs> You'll bow your heads with me. I do believe that for some of us, as we walk out of here today, that there's, there's gonna be a shift. There's, there's gonna be some changing that happens in how we approach life. We're gonna step out of chapter six and we're gonna live right in the middle of chapter eight. There's others of you that came in today and You came in and you feel alone. 
Can I just tell you that Jesus chose you? He saw you right in the middle of all your sin, right in the middle of all your bad decisions. And he's even seeing us in our worst condition, he still chose to come and to willingly give his life for your sins, to pay for them. And maybe you've never accepted his free gift of salvation today. Maybe you, you never said, you come to church, you're part of church things, you're maybe even part of small groups, but you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. And today, you know, today's my day. Today is my day that it's gonna change. I'm gonna start living different. If that's you, I just want you to slip up your hand right now. Be bold, be honest with yourself. Come on, thank you for that hand. Slip them up high. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray. Our church family is gonna pray with you. And we just, the Bible teaches that if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you will be saved. So we're gonna pray full voice, out loud. You can just repeat after me. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for coming to the earth and living a sinless life and then willingly giving it up for my sins. I believe that you came, you, you died, but you rose again and you're coming back to get us. Today, I put my faith in you. I put my hope in you. I make you my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Christ Church. Can we just celebrate what Jesus is doing right now?